Okay, hi everyone. My name is Daniel Joseph Gomez. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so my talk is going to be on a human retrovirus in neuro-oncology and interventional conductome studies, as well as theranostics in nuclear medicine. And I'm with the Jane Lab at Drexel University College of Medicine. I'm also an associate member of the AACR and as well as the SNO or the Society for Neuro-Oncology. I just want to begin with the recognizing World Brain Tumor Day is June 8th. Um, so the guideline for this talk is HIV incidence of glioblastoma, primary and secondary, uh, and novel therapeutic target, AEG1, as well as cerebral glial tumors and HIV infection, brain stem anaplastic glioma in AIDS patients, CNS lymphoma and or CNS lymphomas, non-invasive therapeutics, interventional conductome, conductome trials, navigating the ohms, bridging the connectome to the transcriptome, immunopet imaging guided advanced therapeutics, and nuclear medicine theranostics. So starting with the, uh, the introduction here, HIV-1 infection is associated with an increased incidence of glioblastoma multiform, or GBM. GBM occurs at an increased frequency um, and younger age in the HIV population uh, than the general population. GBM is the most common adult brain tumor that occurs in the central nervous system. And it consists of rapid growth, uh, diffuse, invas uh, diffuse invasiveness with respect to adjacent brain parenchyma, uh, which renders surgical re regression or surgical resection inefficient. HIV is, was not found in glial spe glioma specimens, but the effect of HIV infection on reduced immune surveillance is thought to promote the development of these tumors. And the management of the tumor is the same as the general population. They use surgery, uh, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy. And their survival of glioma patients with HIV is dictated by their tumor, not their HIV status. So uh, the diagnosis of uh, GBM in people living with HIV is severely underreported in the literature. Um, even though we're given the maximum treatment, the overall survival is significantly less than HIV negative, uh, negative people. So it's a poor prognosis of GBM in people living with HIV. And um, it's been inconsistent with previous reports. So the GBM tumors can occur nearly three years after HIV infection or sooner. And further investigation is required for people living with HIV and con, uh, con, con, uh, committant GBM. And also primary central nervous system lymphoma in people living with HIV is, is a distinct entity and management is adopted from people um, or patients that don't have HIV. So the prognosis for HIV related PCNSL is poor as well with the medium survival time being two to four months. Um, but patients with chemotherapy do much better around 1.5 years. So the effects of HIV on the tumor microenvironment. So oncomodulatory uh, viruses, modulatory viruses can affect the tumor microenvironment, triggering neuro, uh, triggering, triggering inflammation and suppressing apoptosis. Uh, initiating angiogenesis and altering tumor metabolism and stimulating tumor cell signaling pathways leading to tumor growth, proliferation, and invasion. There's a higher incidence of malignancies among people living with HIV, even with ART or antiretroviral therapy, suggesting it's more complex um, than just an HIV-associated immune dysregulation. 
there's uh, the, uh, certain oncogenes that are more relevant um, in viral cooperation. Uh, these gene oncogenes are HIV-1 related TAT and VPU genes. And TAT is implicated in increasing angiogenesis, um, which could be a therapeutic target. There's also EBV, LMP1 and EBNA2 genes. And the tumor microenvironment uh, in HIV related malignancies is highly angiogenic. So those blood vessels are forming and characterized by high micro vessel density. HIV-1 P17 can cause dysregulation of biological activity of different immune cells and is involved in aberrant angiogenesis. It exhibits IL-8 chemokine activity, activating multiple, multiple intracellular signaling pathways and promoting angiogenic responses in endothelial cells, which form capillary structures. So ART has dramatically improved the outcome of people living with HIV and the survival of malignant disease has been a major cause of death in this population. HIV and lymphoma is more complex than HIV associated uh, immune dysregulation or deregulation. In cases of HIV related diffuse large B cell lymphoma and Burkitt lymphoma has not improved. Um, HIV HL or Hodgkin's lymphoma is increasing despite the introduction of ART. So let's look at the tumor microenvironment of HIV DLBCL. So DLBCL is the most common form of HIV associated lymphomas. Patients with HIV DLBCL in comparison to sporadic DLBCL have a higher frequency of extranodal disease and prominent association with EBV and have worse prognosis. So there's very little data uh, on the TME be between the sporadic DLBCL and HIV related DLBCL. So there's few studies that have found significant differences between the two. Uh, the TME in HIV DLBCL is highly angiogenic and characterized by high microvessel density compared to sporadic cases. VGF is a primary factor in the angiogenesis, and the presence of the TAP protein in DLBCL TME has been demonstrated in other studies as well. So cancer and HIV, the HIV infection mainly infects CD8 T lymphocytes, dendritic cells and macrophages, and does not target B cells although the TAP protein can be released from HIV-infected cells that penetrate uninfected B cells and work extracellularly on the microenvironment. So HIV-1 does indeed infect several brain cell types, which can affect the astrocytes that serve as a potential reservoir for productive infection, viral persistence, and latency. There's this chronic inflammation that's characteristic um, of HIV-1 infection and induces strong oxidative stress that allows virally induced cancer to evolve. And this drives the neoplastic transformation and develops acquired oncogenic mutations in the cells signaling cascades that drive cell growth and proliferation. So oncogenesis, it correlates with angiogenesis factors, like I said, the VGF and the VGF receptors, um, which modulate and support the tumor growth. Glioma cells can link with HIV-1 envelope protein GP120, and this interaction increases glycolysis and the Warburg effect. Both TAT and GP120 induce epithelial mesenchymal transition, or the EMT, and cell migration via the TGF beta-1 and MAPK signaling pathways. NEF, or the accessory protein negative factor, inhibits apoptotic uh, function of P53, which affects its half-life and DNA binding activity and transcriptional activation. There's also persistent immune inflammation in this HIV-associated carcinogenesis where you have dysfunction of B cells, T cells, and components of cells in the innate immune system, potentially dendritic cells. 
So moving to GBM as a type four astrocytoma, the etiology of GBM has not been fully eludicated. It's believed to be a spontaneous tumor originating from the glial cells of the brain and it can spread and infect other nearby cells. So they originate from astrocytes and sometimes they are called astrocytomas. And the grade four indicates the rapid growth and can often start off as a grade four tumor without any evidence of any low grade tumors. And the GBMs can be located anywhere in the brain and they do not regularly spread outside the brain, but we'll go over some cases where they do. Some common symptoms are headaches, seizures, confusion, memory loss, muscle weakness, visual changes, language deficit, and cognitive changes. And GBM tends to affect older individuals between the ages of 45 to 70 with rare occurrences in children. And the treatments are a combination of surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, alternating electric fields therapy, and immunotherapy, such as immune checkpoint inhibitors. And the average survival time, uh, patients that have undergone combinations of surgery and chemotherapy and radiotherapy is about 14.6 months. Now we'll look at a novel therapeutic target called astrocyte elevated gene one. So in malignant gliomas, astrocyte elevated gene one is implicated in malignant glio glioma progression and invasion. AEG1 enhances proliferation, angiogenesis, chemoresistance, and metastases of malignant cells. Targeting AEG1 could slow down the progression of glioma. And some of the hallmarks of malignant gliomas are tumor proliferation, invasion, angiogenesis, metastases, and chemoresistance. So here's the structure that I, that I did in UCSF Chimera of AEG1 in the PDB is 4QMQ that you can find in the rcsb.org. So here's the pathway of the AEG um, protein and gene. You can see here uh, AEG1 being uh, expressed in the, in the nucleus and then uh, sent out to the cytoplasm, which affects several oncogenic pathways, including HA, RAS, and PI3 kinase and AKT, um, which induces CMIC that, that further propagates this AEG1. There's also HIF alpha interactions with P53, MDM2, NF kappa B, uh, WINT, and beta catenin over here, and GSK3 beta. So, looking at the incidence of cerebral glial tumors, it's more than just a coincidence. We see here on the top left, patient one contrast enhanced computed tomography or CT scan shows a voluminous bifrontal tumor. On the bottom left, patient two in this T1-weighted sagittal magnetic resonance image or MR image reveals a right parietal hyposignal with no gadolinium enhancement. In patient three, you have a contrast uh, enhanced CT scan showing a left parietal occipital tumor with a ring enhancement. And in patient four, you have a coronal T2-weighted MR image showing an increased signal intensity in the right subthalamic and mesoencephalic regions. Um, some histology that they did, the macroscopic view showing the massive enlargement in the thalamus by an astroblastoma, and that's at 1.3x. And then a GFAP or glial fibril acidic protein immunostaining showing the positivity of labeling of malignant glial cells. Um, and that's those are the small vessel, and that's at 750X with an H and E same. So TNF alpha is mitogenic for astrocytes, and TGF beta is found to greatly overexpress in a large cohort of patients with astrocytoma and glioblastoma. And overexpression of TGF beta in patients infected with HIV may encourage this malignant transformation of reactional astrocytic glial proliferation. See more HIV AIDS patients with glial tumors. In case you can't see the chart here, um, some of the countries involved in, uh, in this study was Argentina, USA, France, Mexico, UK, and Thailand. Uh, the diagnosis that they had were oligodendroglial, um, GBM, malignant astrocytoma, anaplastic astrocytoma, and cerebral astrocytoma. The locations went from the right frontal lobe, other frontal lobe, insula, right temporal lobe, 
um, right central sulcus and the left posterior hemisphere, the left basal ganglia, the left parietal occipital lobe, um, the parietal lobe on the right, the pr uh, parietal occipital lobe on the left, and the occipital, the temporal, the right side of the basal ganglia, and the corpus callosum and the cervical cord. Procedures that they did were MRI and biopsy, and then resection, CT, and radiotherapy. And the survival went from one month to two months, uh, less than six months, seven months, less than eight, 10 months, 12 months, 13 months, less than 20, 20 months, and less than 20 years. Now moving to the brainstem of anaplastic glioma. Uh, this is a case report, two case reports from Germany and the USA. Um, and they did a CT and biopsy and survival went from less than one month. And then in Germany, it was 64 days and it was in the brainstem. So going more inferior. Previous incidents are reported with HIV and AIDS patients uh, presenting with cerebral astrocytomas. This is a case was a 55 year old Hispanic man patient with HIV diagnosed three years ago. Uh, he presented with a brainstem anaplastic glioma, and it's never been reported as of 2013 when this study was done. Uh, it was difficult to, to diagnose. Uh, they did scans, histology, and subsequent treatment. Histopathology revealed the anaplastic glioma and atypical glial perforation, as well as strong KI-67 immunoreactivity. And they, give, they gave palliative care on the request for the family. Um, and it's believed that the HIV enters the CNS by infecting macrophages or T cells via the GP120, binding to CCR5 and CXCR4 receptors. Uh, some neurons and astrocytes are thought to share these receptors which can result in subsequent infection. And this can disrupt the chemokine and inflammatory signaling and alter neuronal and glial functions. So HIV can cross the blood-brain barrier by using TNF-alpha. Macrophages and astrocytes are known to communicate with, other, um, with each other through feedback and feedforward loops. HIV infection can compromise this interaction. And the, for example, the HIV infected macrophages increasing production of TNF alpha interleukin beta, which can induce astrocytosis. Now, looking at a secondary glioblastoma metastases in a young HIV infected patient, we have a 32 year old seemingly healthy man with acute synecope while practicing physical activities, had a hemiplegia on the right side, the right labial comm commissure deviation and disorientation. In the emergency unit, he did a brain scan, a CT scan, which showed an intraparietal hematoma in the left basal ganglia, measuring at 3.1 .1 and 2.8 centimeters cubed, with edema in the small area, with contralateral deviation in the midline structures. So here you have the MRI image of the brain when the tumor was diagnosed. A and B show, you can see the first MRI image of the patient that under, underwent um, the MRI and discovered that it was a grade three anaplastic astrocytoma. So here you see the astrocytoma and A and B, here's the axial and uh, sagittal sections. And then in C and D, we can see the perfusion magnetic resonance uh, imaging with surrounding edema and peripheral contrast hypocapnia indicating the malignant neoplasm. Here in E, we can observe from the H&E staining, uh, the first resection of the CNS lesion. And here we can note the gemistoic astrocyte proliferation that went with mild to moderate pleomorphism. In F and G here, we can observe the first magnetic resonance imaging in the patient um, that, uh, that he underwent, the MRI image, uh, which suggests the grade three anaplastic astrocytoma had already progressed to glioblastoma. And you can see that there. Looking at, at these, so this is what the gemistocytic uh, astrocyte proliferation looks like. Here in A, we have the tumor parenchyma and large, there are large cells abundant with eosinophilic cytoplasm, rich in glial fibrils and peripherally pushed to hyperchromic nuclei. So this is the H and E staining at 400X. And B is an immunohistochemical expression of GFAP and neoplastic gemistocytes. And this was biotin and streptoviatin peroxidase method, and this is at 400X. Looking at the same case, here's the T9, the tumor has moved to T9 
in the spinal cord. So this is a thoracic spine and neck MRI image. And in A, we can see the magnetic resonance image of the thoracic spine where the pathological fracture of the ninth thoracic vertebral body was diagnosed with the spinal cord compression. So the biopsy of T9 uh, body mass was diagnosed with glioblastoma metastases in the vertebral body. Looking at the anterior neck, we can observe this augmentation in the anterior neck tissue. The lymph node biopsy together with the IHC or immunohistochemistry studies also diagnosed with metastases of the glioblastoma. Here in C, we see a, a neoplastic gemistocytic proliferation infiltrating the skin. So this could be uh, um, you know, increased melanoma that occurs. And then the neoplastic diffuse glial fibril acidic protein positivity for the astrocytes, um, where that you can see the GFAP positive stain, and then also the KI67 positive cells. They further on and went and did a, some immunohist or some fluorescent imaging. So they characterized the glioblastoma cells isolated from the spinal cord metastases. And in A and B, we can observe the MET GBM18 primary cells that were isolated from this patient in his last surgery for decompression and stain for GFAP, as well as S100 beta to confirm the glial or origins. And then in C, you can see the staining for SOX2, which is a stem cell marker demonstrating the cell line has properties identical to cancer stem cells. And in D, we can see the staining for Vimitin, which demonstrates that this cell line possesses EMT properties that are closely related to my, the capacity to migrate and undergo metastases. In E, we see the cell staining for Nestin, which demonstrates that it's neuronal origin. And then in F, you see a little bit of signal of HIV-1 P24, but not as much as expected for HIV. And then the P, uh, CNS lymphoma, they're at higher risk for people with living with HIV. And the most common histological type is the DLBCL. Uh, so PN, PCNSL is one of the most common brain tumors in people living with HIV and is an AIDS-defining malignancy. CT and MRI are most commonly used. Uh, we use CT often, it's contrast enhanced, where most lesions can reveal the enhancement. Uh, while solid or more commonly peripheral uh, or then periphery are this the ring pattern. And then, so although CT is usually done, um, MRI is the modality of choice to evaluate people living with HIV and brain pathology. Uh, people living with HIV are more likely to have multiple lesions, hemorrhages, and necrosis within the tumor, as well as patterns that contrast this periphery ring enhancement and solid component of the tumor on a T1 weighted image. There's also T2 weighted images as well. So looking at the PCNSL and people living with HIV, here you have a CT without contrast and a CT with contrast. And you can see uh, where it shows in the arrow here, the, the definition of the ring pattern or ring enhancement with contrast. So if, if possible, use that. Um, you can see here, um, there's, you know, this is the axial plane of the CT and the, you see the hyperdense enhancing ring. And then the stars are the prominent surrounding hypodense edemia. And there's also a subtle second lesion that's seen on the posterior parietal lobe. So imaging modalities can play a critical role in treatment plan and the outcome, uh, planning targeted therapies and monitoring uh, response in neuro-oncology. So here we have MRI uh, T1 weighted with contrast in A, B, and C. And this shows two peripheral enhancing tumors that are better than CT. Additionally, three components of the tumor can be separated with color-coded col uh, color labels to edemia, solid tumor, and central necrosis, creating these radio phenotypes. And that can be used for uh, feature analysis when indirectly obtaining information about the tumor microscopic composition and environment with artificial intelligence methods. So D, E, and F are the axial flare sequence at the exact same level as a T1 uh, weighted image that clearly depicts the surrounding edema that's better than the T1 on A. And it's very accurate, the segmentation of the edema volume in E and F. 
So if you don't know what flare is, flare is fluid attenuated inversion recovery. And it's an MRI technique that shows the tissue T2 prolongation as bright while suppressing or darkening the cerebral spinal fluid or CSF signal. So it clearly reveals lesions in proximity to CSF such as cerebral cortical lesions. Now moving on to NIBS, which is a novel non-invasive therapeutic technique, um, an imaging technique. So this is a personalized image guided non-invasive brain simulation technique in gliomas. So here we have uh, repetitive transmagnetic stimulation or TMS device that can operate at different low and high frequencies for inhibitory or excitatory effects. So you'll see LTD-like effects or LTP-like effects. LTD is long-term depression and then LTP is long-term potentiation-like effects uh, with the NIBs. So you can see um, that these effects are mediated by NMDA and AMP, A receptors, the GABA system, gene induction like BD and F, and neuromodulator changes like dopamine. And you can also have a paired pulse or a single pulse with this technique as well. So you can do multifocal TES, bifocal TES on a TES device. And this shows the current, which can be um, constant or direct, like an anode, which is excitatory or a cathode, which is inhibitory, an osculatory or alternating specific frequency for TX. And then for TRINs, you see the same oscillatory or altern alternating current uh, at white noise from 1 to 640 hertz. And the mechanisms can be membrane polarization, entrainment or resonance, or stochastic resonance. And the timing is long-term or short-term for uh, TX. So this approach can be applied to patients with brain tumors and possibly identify core regions whose functionality is altered, causing core symptomatology presence uh, uh, in patients. So the workflow would be from baseline assessment, doing the neuroimaging, the anatomical MRI, functional MRI, perfusion MRI, and PET imaging, as well as cognitive, neurological, and psychiatric assessments. And then in pre-surgery, you would start to suppress the tumor-promoting neural activity, uh, tumor perfusion reduction, and cognitive restoration and symptoms alleviation. And then post-surgery restoration of the TAMS uh, tumor suppressive phenotype or the tumor associated macrophages, you would enhance uh, the drug delivery. And long-term application would be, again, to the, the tumor perfusion reduction. So you can do this in a local approach with MRI guided biophysical modeling, which is optimized the TES for tumor peritumor tissue, tissue stimulation. So with this local approach, you have migration control or galvanotaxis. You have the restoration of TAMS, tumor suppressive phenotype. Uh, suppression of neuronal tumor promoting activity and tumor perfusion reduction and increases of the blood brain barrier permeability to enhance drug delivery. There's also the network based approach, like a functional MRI, where you can start to map the symptoms and begin cognitive restoration. And, and then there's also the diffusion or DMRI, as well as resting state functional MRI. And then you would combine with a PET or a PWI to predict the tumor migration and reoccurrence, and then eventually slow down the tumor growth and migration. So this is what's been termed connectome lesion-based mapping. Now we'll go over a MEG or magnetoencephalographic uh, conductome study. Uh, to understand MEG a little bit better in the data collection and analysis, here we go from 306 MEG sensors and filter those to 10 frequency bands and begin to parcel out the templates with source estimation. So you get about 90 brain sources. And with those 90 brain areas, you get an FC profile or a functional connectivity profile. And that's the envelope correlation. So there in C, you see the MEG signal that's estimated in two brain areas, uh, the left and right superior parietal in the 10.5 to 21.5 hertz frequency band and the corresponding amplitude envelope low pass filtered with the cutoff frequency of 0.5 hertz. So that's the sort of data that you're looking at with MEG. In this study, it was a cerebral primitive tumor with uh, curagical in indication. So they did MEG and MRI in a phase one interventional clinical trial. There are 28 participants enrolled 
And the MEG study, it was the official study was official title was Magnetoencephalographic Study of Leo Tumors Electromagnetic Signature. And the study start date was September 20, uh, 2013 and completed in January 2018. It was located in France and supported by the VGA. The principal investigator was Francois Berger. And the primary outcome measures were MEG and MRI data in tumor grade prediction, anamorphopathologic uh, uh, and clinical data in tumor grade prediction, and secondary outcomes such as the measurements of molecules involved in glial cell neutralization expression in tumor samples and tumor growth mod mod modelization from patient MEG and MRI data. So the correlation between MEG analysis of the tumor and its periphery and the stage and treatment were done in this clinical trial. But let's get to this conductome. What does a conductome mean? The conductome is the totality of factors that influence behavior, emphasizing its utility as a unifying concept that allows for the true, the true study of a systemic view of a living organism. And then there's the Human Connectome Project or HCP style neuroimaging like the MEG, EEG, and MRI. So you can have task fMRI or task MEG, which measures gambling, emotional processing, motor, relational processing, social cognition, language processing, working memory, and motor, as well as language processing and like story of math. This is what the MEG looks like. You can either be sitting down upright or in the supine position. And you use the connectome workbench and you get these uh, you get these the data outputs. So this is what the data looks like with a connectome workbench. It's a really, really sophisticated uh, technique, the MEG, and non-invasive. And you get all these images of the brain of pattern activity. So you can um, sign up for a government account in the United States and you can work with the connectome workbench. So moving on from the genome to the connectome, how do we connect it? So how do we go from the connectome to the genome? So this is a, a wiring diagram, a schematic wiring diagram of the scaffolds which the connectome can be built. The best known are the cajals. And you can see the, this example of a periphery sensory receptors in the spinal cord and the brain, um, and then back to the motor neurons and muscles. So these arrows here, um, where they indicate the direction of the descending motor impulses and ascending sensory impressions. So it was pieced together from observations of multiple samples in the direction of current flow was inferred from the structure. In B here, you see the projectome, um, which is a well-known example of the van essence and Fellman's summary of connections among the cortical areas. And these are associated with vision and other modalities. Here's an example of another connectome for C. elegans, the tail of C. elegans. And this was reconstructed from serial electron micrographs within the individual uh, lines uh, is proportional to relative frequency of synaptic contacts. So here's C. elegans. Um, you can see the brain, uh, which was done by University of Leeds there in the colored, um, that's the brain of C. elegans. And then here's the, the nervous system and the neuronal support that was done uh, and published in Nature on August 4th, 2021. You can see the brain development there from C. elegans. So looking at more ohms, kind of navigating these ohms. So the structures associated with pr uh, principal ohms are the genome, proteome, transcriptome, metabolome, which are all microscopic and they're being uh, associated with different biological molecules. Okay, but what about the micro-ohms? So the micro-ohms includes the atom-ohm, as well as the elementary particle-ohm and mo molecule-ohm. And the disease-ohm is a prediction model, which relates the micro to the macro. And the macro-ohms would be like the physiologome, which is a network-based approach and the degrees of correlation in the time series of different organs, such as the lung and the heart, and the spatial and temporal scales, and they stem from the physical structures it considers. Other macroohms are the soci sociologome or the cyclome, which are different macroohms uh, to be further investigated. So the causal change that links the observation observed correlation between a micro property like a SNP or a single nucleotide polymorphism and a macro property like atherosclerosis, and then the subsequent micro, myocardial infarction is po poorly understood. We can't necessarily go from a SNP 
to a condition like a mitocardial infarction. So we need the cell at the cellular level that must enter as a relevant scale that links the two. So perhaps this would be the myocardial infarctome. And again, the, the conductome, uh, it's, it's linked, think in terms of temporal development of change in behavior. So it links the cause and effect, the natural response, the effect to the external or internal stimuli, which are the causes. These are complex networks and they consider the interactions. And the neuroom, or neuroom, is the natural structural element, the CNS and its description at multiple spatial scales, from the cellular to the cortical, and, in, and all the intermediary between the causes of behavior and their consequences. So how do we bridge the gap from the connectome to the transcriptome? Uh, there's broad spatial gradients that track variations in regional cellular architecture. There's microcircuitry, interregional connectivity, which has a molecular signature. That's interregional connectivity. Uh, the connectome topology are superimposed on these broad gradients. Uh, Brain-wide uh, gene expression atlases are used, and there's spatial patterning of gene expression and neuronal connectivity that are closely linked. So the most widely used uh, are Allen Mouse Brain Atlas or the AMBA and the Allen Human Brain Atlas or the AHBA. And these are some images from those databases. You can see the structures of the brain uh, from the human as well as the mouse here. That's also mouse, more mouse. And then uh, in trends, uh, cognitive sciences, there's also this node and edge. Um, this is how we bridge the gap from the connectome to the transcriptome. We look at nodes in the brain and the edges, and then we make relationships uh, between the node uh, role and the module. So there's intermodule edges and intramodule edges. And you can start to see the difference in thickness as well as the connectivity differences as they relate to their average risk of gene expression. So we take a gene expression atlas of different regions. We get a heat map of that of expression. So we have gene co-expression, the correlation between gene expression profiles. So we get a gene by gene um, histogram and then we get the eigengene. And we take the eigengene and we move it to the connectome. We associate that with the connectome. And there we see within the modules, between the modules, and the correlated gene expression. Some of the highlights, uh, recent uh, tr uh, technical advances have enabled the construction of brain-wide atlases of thousands of genes across many different brain regions. And so you can track the variations of regional cellular architecture, microcircuitry, and interregional connectivity, and they may represent a molecular signature of regional specialization. Uh, more specific signatures of the reg uh, interregional connectivity and connectome topology, and they are superimposed on these broad gradients and are conserved across different species. So here you see the brain transcriptome follows a broad spatial trend that track brain network architecture. You can see that there, they've done a principal component analysis and dimension analysis as well. Here you can see the hierarchical gradients in gene expression and connectional architecture. So you see the soma size as it relates to the axon diameter, as well as the boton size and the axon length. So you have the external pyramidal and the internal pyramidal. Um, the neuro neuronal density has increases with feedback and feed forward loops. Um, and how long it is, is it 30 to 60 millimeters? And they also compared macaques to humans, looking at the T1, T2 ratio and the hierarchy level. So this is support for the atlas-based approach as a method for gaining insights of the transcriptional correlates of spatially varying neural phenotypes, both in health and in disease. So the evidence here uh, reviews that indicates that atom anatomical variations in gene expression closely track variations in the connectional architecture. So these variations are dominated by large scale spatial gradients upon which are superimposed and more specific transcriptional signatures of the network connectivity and topology. Moving on to immunopet imaging. Um, this is a, a novel and advanced and new technique, immunopositron emission tomography or IPET. 
which uh, exquisitely fuses the extraordinary targeting specificity of a monoclonal antibody and the superior sensitivity resolution of PET. So this is a paradigm shift for molecular imaging modalities. So you can get the whole body scan with uh, the, the immunopet, and you have an immuno checkpoints here in non-small cell lung cancer using the F uh, fluorodeoxyglucose PET CT scan in this patient with N NSCLC that showed lung tumors and mediastinal uh, lymph node metastases with high glucose metabolism. And that's there in A, you can see that there with the red signal in the lymph nodes. So in B, you have a PD-1 specific uh, zeronium uh, or ZR DF, uh, sorry, DIF novolumab immunopet CT image demonstrating a heterogeneous uptake of the radio tracer between the tumor lesions. And then in C, the uptake of PD-1, uh, F18, uh, BMS, um, PET, CT. And it was seen within and between the tumors as well. So with the ZR, uh, RTX or rituximab, immunopet imaging, this was done on non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. This is a patient circulating with CD20 positive lymphocytes, which are significant. There's a significant uptake of the uh, ZR uh, RTX, which was observed in the spleen. Um, which blocked, which was blocked by preloading um, with unlabeled RTX uh, prior to injection of the ZR RTX. And the spleen is indicated with the black arrows. You can see preloaded or without preload and then with preload. <clears throat> and then in B, you have the same patient preloaded with uh, ZR RTX uptake in the involved lymph nodes, but enhanced uptake of the radio tracer within the visceral lesions. So developing the next generation uh, immunopet probes, uh, you can see the cancer stem cell markers are used here, the L5 NCS, uh, and, that's, and that's done with a novel uh, chetilator uh, L5 NCS. <clears throat> so they use IgG, HCAB, VHH, and SCFV, uh, many body and di diabody. Here's some more. Uh, chethylators like DFO. Um, and then we have amino PET imaging of HER2 expression. So in A, you see a T1 weighted MR image of a 46 year old woman showing up with brain metastases from breast cancer. And then the PET scan is, or the PET CT is a ZR diff pertuzumab uh, immuno PET. CT image of the same patient demonstrating a, ver a, a varying uptake of the radio tracer in the brain metastases. You can see the red signal here. And then in C, you see the CT, uh, as and D is the PET. And then in E, you have the chemical structure of this AI, AIF, NODA, TZ, TCO, GK, RSD, 2, 2 RS, 15 D. Um, and then in F, you have the immunopet of a human ovary ovarian cancer xenograph at two and three hours after injection of this chemical structure. So how do we tune the immunopet MR, MR image? Uh, so here's again the, the brain. In this, in this instance, it, it is a glioma. So they used representative immunopet MR, MR imaging of a patient with diffuse intrinsic patein glioma after convection enhanced delivery. And you can see the axial, the upper sections, and the sagittal, the lower sections fused uh, PET MR, MR image showing the predominant retention in the brainstem. And in this case, uh, there's servers that the theragnostic agent allows for concurrent imagery, dosimetry, and therapy. And this was done two hours, 28 hours, four days, and eight days in time scale. So what is theranostics in nuclear medicine and precision oncology? So this is, are there are nuclear theranostics. So there are theranostic agents imaging, which have imaging features. So they use typically an 18 FDG PET uh, in theranostics and they happen in pairs. So they can share the same target. So there's theranostic pairs. And then perhaps you can uh, look at some future directions for this. So here's a diagram that provides introductory overview of nuclear theragnostics and specific agents may be labeled with gamma emitting uh, radionuclide for PET spec imaging in combination with alpha or beta particle emitting radionuclei. So alpha beta would be the therapy and the gamma would be the imaging. You have your molecular target and receptor and you're using PET and spec. So the PET and spec 
will identify this biological phenomenon. You have, you know, the gamma again for diagnosis and the alpha beta for emission for therapy. You have different radioisotypes and specific molecules that are detectable, quantifiable, and they can predict response, predict toxicity, and pro prognosis. Um, there's, you know, they, they, the therapy takes into effect, uh, account the radiobiological effect, the toxicity, and the immediate access assessment if imaging is possible. So this is a theranotic a theranostic approach in nuclear medicine. So here's, um, in this case, this is the classical theranostic approach with the anterior and posterior scans or WBS or whole body scans used to diagnose, treat, and assess the treatment response of metastatic neuroblastoma in an eight-year-old patient. So here in A, we have a diagnostic whole body scan showing the mesogastric and skeletal lesions, and those are shown by the red arrows. And then in B, the restaging of the WBS scans showing the partial response after chemotherapy. And then in C, you see the post-treatment whole body scan and the axial spec, spec uh, SBECT and CT image showing the delivery of a radio tracer to the mesogastric lesion and the new bone lesion in the left ac uh, acetabulum that was not present at the diagnostic imaging. So that's a, a you know pediatric patient with neuro metastatic neuroblastoma uh, treated with nuclear medicine ther theranostics. And this was done by uh, Gomes, Marin and, and Radiographics in 2020. So this is the paper that that study was from. It was theranostics and nuclear medicine emerging and re-emerging integrated imaging and therapies in the era of precision oncology. So this was Gomes, Marin, et al. in uh, 2020 and published in Radiographics. So he said, uh, more than a novel approach, the field of theranostics is approaching Paul Eckler's or Eckler's original proposed magic bullet, uh, capable of bridging hope and having a profound effect on the lives of millions of patients. So in summary, I went over the cancer of HIV-1 uh, effects of HIV on the TM, TME or tumor microenvironment, glioblastoma, uh, multiform, high-grade astrocytoma. I showed you a novel therapeutic target of astrocyte elevated gene one. Uh, we went over the characteristics of cerebral glial tumors and HIV infection, as well as HIV AIDS patients with glial tumors and brainstem anaplastic gliomas in AIDS patients, as well as primary central nervous system lymphoma imaging with people living with HIV. We went over the NEBS technique or non-invasive therapeutics with TMS devices, the glial tumors of electromagnetic signature study by MEG and the conductome, and the HPC style neuroimaging such as MEG and MRI. We went over the different ohms, ohm suite ohm, and the genome and connectome and, the and from the molecule ohm to the neurome. We bridged the gap between the connectome and the transcriptome. We went over immunopet imaging and guided advanced therapeutics and drug development. And lastly, we went over theragnostics and nuclear medicine for precision oncology. I just want to leave you with this quote. Uh, it says, those of us fighting the brain tumor beast are a band of brothers and sisters. None of us want to be on this journey, journey, but we are. So we fight side by side, helping each other with love, information, and support. And that's from Dr. Michael Gabriel. So I just want to thank you for your time. And if you guys have any questions, I'm open for that.